Good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting in 2023 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. We received apology today from Mercedes Vialba, MSP, and her place uh, can I welcome Rhoda Grant, MSP. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to please switch off or uh, the mobile phones or put them to silent. And the first item of business is a declaration of interests. In accordance with Section 3 of the Code of Conduct, I invite Rhoda Grant, MSP, to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee. Um, thank you, Convener. I don't think I have any relevant interests, but I would just for the record say I'm a Unison member and a member of the Co-op Party. Okay, no, thank you very much for that, Rhoda. The next item of business is to decide whether to take item 7 in private. Is the committee content to take this item in private? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And our agenda item number 3, we are considering two instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on the draft Social Security Information Sharing Scotland Amendment Regulations 2024 SSI 2023 draft and the draft Council Tax Variation for Unoccupied Dwellings Scotland Amendment Regulations 2023. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yes. And our agenda item number four, we're considering two instruments subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSI 2023, 311 and 312. Is the committee content with these instruments? <clears throat> Under agenda item number five, we are considering two instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSI 2023, 310 and 333. Is the committee content with these instruments? Under agenda item number six, we are considering the Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill at stage two. I ask members to refer to their copy of the bill, the marshalled list of amendments and the groupings of amendments. We are joined today by the Minister for Victims and Community Safety, Siobhan Brown, MSP, and four Scottish Government officials. I can remind the Minister's officials that they cannot participate in any Stage 2 proceedings, but they can communicate with the Minister directly. We have a number of amendments to consider and dispose of for this Bill. If the votes are required today, I will call for members to vote yes first, and then call for members to vote no, and then for any abstentions. Our members should do so by raising their hand. The clerks will collect the vote and pass the, the vote to me for, to read out for the confirmation of the result. I will take stage two slowly so that we can have time to manage the process properly. So with that, I will refer uh, colleagues to the, the marshalled list. <coughs> so, <coughs> um, the first uh, set of amendments to section one is the appointment, resignation and removal of trustees. So I call amendment 52 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Jeremy Balfour to move amendment 52 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good uh, morning to you and good morning to the uh, Minister and to colleagues. Uh, can I, before I go into detail in regard to this amendment, just uh, put on record my thanks to all those who have engaged with the committee, uh, both at uh, stage one and in written evidence, and also for those who have uh, been in touch with me um, around amendments to this bill, and in particular my thanks to the Law Society of Scotland, who have been uh, very helpful in the work that I have been working on. In regard to Amendment 52, um, this would be to leave out in section 1, page 1, line 12, the word expedient and insert necessary. The effect of this amendment, Convener, would be to provide that the court may appoint an additional trustee under section 1, 1A, only if the court considers it necessary to do so. The reason for bringing forward this amendment uh, this morning is to allow a court to appoint an additional trustee where it considers it expedient to do so, um, as it represents a weakening of the common law position here in Scotland, which refers to the word necessary. This amendment would simply reinstate the position as is in the common law in Scotland at the moment, and we didn't seek to change that, and I think it has worked well over the last number of years and doesn't need altered at this stage. In regard to amendment number 53, uh, this amendment clarifies the mere nomination of a sole trustee does not take that individual a trustee unless they have accepted the office in writing or after intimation of the appointment. 
have acted in a fashion which indicates they have accepted office as trustee. The reason for this is very practical that a, a group of trustees could, in theory, uh, unless we put in this amendment, um, have somebody as a trustee who doesn't want to do the job or isn't ready to do the job. The office of trustee should not be forced on a sole nominee who has not accepted that office and who does not wish to do so. And in my view, that person has to give their consent to it. And this amendment simply clarifies that area of law. In regard to the other amendments within this grouping, I look forward to hearing what the Scottish Government has have to say on them before responding to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, ask the Minister to speak to Amendment 1 and other amendments in the group. Minister. Good morning, Committee, and thank you, Convener. Firstly, uh, turning to the amendments in my name, which is Amendments 1, 2, 3, 44 and 45, are a package aimed at increasing the safeguards of sole trustees. This was a particular concern raised by the Committee after hearing evidence directly from trustees. Amendments 1 and 2 prevent resignation by a sole capable trustee unless they first assume an additional trustee or a judicial factor is appointed to administer the trust. This will prevent a sole capable trustee resigning their role and leaving only an incapable sole trustee. <clears throat> Section 5 of the bill as introduced contains a default rule that trustees will have the power to resign office subject to some exceptions. The power of resignation is more expansive than existing powers under the legislation, but there is no procedural requirements for trustee re resignation, such as a requirement for intimation of co-trustees. Amendment 3 makes clear that trustees must intimate their resignation to co-trustees. This will prevent situations where one person is left as a sole trustee without their knowledge. The amendment sets out that trustees require an intimate, intimate their resignation to all other trustees who are traceable or any judicial factor, with the resignation being effective from the date of intimation. Amendments 44 and 45 make necessary consequential adjustments. Trusts are used in a wide variety of circumstances and it's important that the general law on trust does not hinder the flexibility of trust to provide a solution to a wide range of problems. Ultimately, whether a sole trustee is appointed is a matter for the truster who determines how a trust is to be administered. There may be valid reasons for the choice of appointing a sole trustee and the person who best placed to decide this would be the truster. While appointment of a sole trustee carries potential future difficulties for the administration of the trust, this is a matter best left to an informed trustee. Taken together, however, these amendments give an added protection to trusts where a trustee has chosen to use a sole trustee or circumstances have led to there being a sole trustee of a trust and address the concerns raised by the committee at the stage one report. Amendment six responds to significant practical difficulties that co-trustees may have in removing a trustee who was appointed as a trustee in their professional capacity and is no long, longer a member of their profession, but does not meet the criteria set out in section 7.1 of the bill as introduced. Now, this matter does come to light following the failure of McClure's solicitors, where the Scottish Government has heard that trustees appointed in a professional capacity will only agree to resign office in exchange for payment of such money, of a sum of money. The sum may be just short of the legal costs which the trust property would likely incur if a court application to remove a trustee was raised. Together, this potentially leaves co-trustees and beneficiaries in a difficult position and the administration of a trust may grind to a halt with all the difficulties that this may cause. The bill introduces an important distinction between lay and professional trustees, and I believe that it is important that trustees who are appointed in their professional capacity are held to a different and higher standard than lay trustees. While the bill cannot resolve wider issues caused by the collapse of McClure's, we can learn lessons about how failure impacts trusts and their management. Amendment 6 adds to Section 7 of the bill on removal of trustees by co-trustees in, in narrowly defined cases, as provided 
by subsection 1A to be inserted, a trustee who is a member of a regulated profession and has been appointed or assumed for the trust as a professional trustee, a class of trustees provided in the section 27.2 of the bill, that is, a person who is in the course of business provides professional services in relation to managing the affairs of a trust, may be removed by, from office by their co-trustees in the circumstances set out in the sub, new subsection 1B. Subsection 1B sets out that such a trustee may be removed where they are no longer a member of a, a member of a regulated profession, for example, that could be retirement or removement from the ro removal from the role, or are no longer able to practice. This also covers situations where a person may remain a member but does not have a practicing certificate or is suspended from practice since different regulatory regimes may approach that differently. Convener, moving on to Jeremy Balfour's amendments 52 and 53 under section 22 of the Trust Scotland Act 1921. The court has a power to appoint new trustees. The court of session has the common law power to appoint new trustees too. The SLC consulted on these powers and felt that the current law could be simplified. It re recommended a statutory provision, which is section one of the bill. I understand that there has been some co concern that the use of expedient in section one is a lower standard than the, co the current common law position under which the court may only appoint a new trustee where necessary. But I note, however, that the necessity isn't always a requirement of the current statutory power. The court's power of appointment can only be exercised if such appointment is shown to be expedient for the administration of the trust or where there is no capable or traceable trustee. That should be sufficient to avoid any significant risk of unnecessary or vexatious applications under this section and also broad enough to allow courts to usefully intervene where trusts find themselves in administrative difficulty. Moving on to amendment number 53, while I understand that the member has taken an interest in the use of sole tr trustees and wants to see more protection for them, my view is that amendment 53 has the potential to make the law more uncertain and create unintended effects for sole trusteeships. <clears throat> For example, it is not clear whether such ex acceptance should apply where a trustee is appointed or assumed under the sections 1, 2 or 3 of the Bill and how the general conveyance of the trust property to them under section 4 would operate in relation to this amendment. In addition, the amendment does not take into account situations through which an existing trustee becomes a sole trustee, for instance through the resignation or death of co-trustees. The position at common law on acceptance is well settled. No one can be compelled to be a trustee and acceptance does not have to be in writing. The fact that taking on the administration is enough to indicate acceptance. I would remind the committee that the bill is not an attempt to codify the law of trust, but is instead meant to clarify the law and resolve issues that arise in practice. I'm not aware of any stakeholder suggesting that acceptance of office was a significant practical issue for trustees or for sole trustees, and this amendment could cause the kind of uncertainty that we are trying to clear up. But if the committee agreed, then I would need to carefully consider how this interacts with the other sections in the bill where trustees can be appointed with a view to making possible amendments for stage three. If the member wishes to press amendments 52 and 53, which is not part of the committee stage one recommendations to a vote, then I would ask the committee to reject them. I would ask the members to support my amendments 1, 2, 3, 6, 44 and 45 in this group. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can, can I thank the Minister for her explanation around her amendments? Um, I particularly welcome um, amendment 6, which I think does give clarity in regard to the differential between someone acting as a trustee professionally and those <coughs> acting um, in um, a voluntary or different basis. And I hope that that will give um, some clarity going forward in regard to situations. Um, and I also welcome the other amendments that she is bringing forward in this section. Um, I, I will be uh, coming a person my two amendments. Um, I think in regard to Amendment 52, it 
is an area that simply clarifies the common law and is what the courts, I think, have been practising over the years. And so I, I actually think this simply doesn't change anything. It simply clarifies what is happening. In regard to Section 53 uh, within my uh, name, I also will be moving this. Um, there has been, um, I have been in conversations uh, with um, lawyers and with the Law Society, and they do think that this does need clarified in regard to going forward. Um, depending on if this amendment is accepted or not by the committee, um, I, I would hope that, either way, that there could be further discussions with Scottish Government so that this can be clarified. But I think it would be good at this stage to have it on the face of the bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr Balfour. Any other colleagues? Any questions? No? OK. Uh, Minister, just, just uh, kind of one point. It's not a question. Just uh, regarding the amendments with regards to, uh, because of the experience of McClure's, I very much welcome these amendments coming forward. Uh, and we're certainly constituents of mine, also certainly of colleagues around the table uh, and across the UK will certainly be pleased. Uh, that, uh, that that sorry situation is having a positive effect upon upon this bill to help people going forward. So thank you. Uh, so, uh, so with that, um, so Jeremy Balfour to wind up or press or withdraw the amendment 52. Uh, move 52, please, Kavina. Okay. So the question is: Amendment 52 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Okay. So there'll be a division. So, all those in favour, uh, please raise your hands. All those against? And there will be no abstentions. So, the result of the vote is um, 3 4, uh, 2 against, and no abstain. So, Amendment 52 is agreed to. So, the question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that sections two to four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to section five and I call amendment number one in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 52. I ask the minister to move formally. Moved. Okay, thank you. So the question is that amendment number one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 53 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 52. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, Convener, please. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Okay, there will be a division. So <clears throat> all those in favour, please raise your hands. All those against. And there's no abstentions. So the result of the division is 3 4, 2 against, and no abstentions. So Amendment 53 is agreed to. I call amendment number two in the name of the Minister, uh, already debated with amendment 52. I ask the Minister to move formally. Thank you, convener. Sorry, bear with me one moment. Convener. No, sorry, moved. Okay, thank you. So the question is that amendment number two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call amendment number three in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 52. Ask the Minister to move formally. Move convener. Thank you. The question is Amendment number 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> the question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. After Section 5 is capacity and appropriate persons. I call Amendment number 4 in the name of the Minister. Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. I remind members that amendments 43 and 51 are direct alternatives, and that is that they can both be moved and decided upon. The text of whichever is the last agreed is uh, sorry. The text of whichever is last agreed to is what will appear in the bill. So, I ask the minister to move amendment number four and speak to all the amendments in the group. Moved, um, convener. Convener, um, amendment number four in my name adds a new section confirming that a resignation power may be exercised on an incapable trustee's behalf by a guardian. If such a trustee is a sole trustee or where there is no other trustee who is both capable and traceable, the guardian's power of resignation cannot be exercised unless an additional trustee is assumed or appointed or a judicial factor is appointed to administer the trust.
The power of the Guardian to appoint a new trustee is restricted to the power to appoint only one trustee. This is consistent with our wider policy position that administration of the trust should lie with the trustees insofar as reasonably practical. Amendments 4, 7, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 26, 27 and 41 address an issue which was highlighted by SPICE in its research briefing paper. The bill at several different points makes provision for the representation of the interests of beneficiaries aged under 16. For instance, Section 10 provides for the guardian of a child beneficiary to be able to, to consent to the discharge of a trustee on behalf of a child beneficiary. The definition of guardian in Section 74, however, does not refer to those parental rights in relation to a child beneficiary. These amendments resolve this issue and cover the various of avenues via which a person might obtain parental responsibilities and parental rights in relation to a minor beneficiary or a potential beneficiary. The categories of person are restricted to those having the specific responsibility or right to act as a beneficiary's legal representative and includes persons who hold parental rights in relation to a beneficiary or potential beneficiary under the equivalent legislation in England, Wales and in Northern Ireland. Moving on to amendment number 43, the bill uses a familiar definition of incapable, which is similar but not identical to the definition of incapable found in the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000. Stakeholders and the committee have rightly pointed out that there are significant and far-reaching changes recommended to the mental health legislation and it is clearly undesirable for the meaning of incapable in trust law to differ from the usual widely understood definition while these recommendation changes are ex recommended changes are explored. I can see the merit in making sure that the bill does not diverge from general law on capacity and ensuring that it will keep pace with any changes in that area. Amendment number 43 in my name therefore aligns the definition of incapable used in the bill with a wider inca incapacity legislation. At the same time, bearing in mind the recommendations for reform of capacity legislation and the committee's recommendations on this bill, I think it is sensible for ministers to be able to amend the definition in line with any future changes which would be subject to the affirmative procedure. Clearly, the precise nature of the changes that may be made in the future cannot be anticipated at this stage and conferring such a power on ministers will help to ensure such flexibility to allow trust law to keep pace with our understanding of incapacity. <clears throat> at the same time, it is made clear that a person without legal capacity includes a child. The term legal capacity is used twice in the bill when dis discussing supervisors and protectors and I believe that this is helpful to set out what we mean by this in the bill. The amendment makes the position clear that legal incapacity includes the non-age of an appointed supervisor or protector. Some types of trust, for instance testamentary trusts, can be drafted well in advance of when we expect them to take effect. An individual may appoint their children as a protector in expectation that when they die they will be in an age to assume the role but the early death of a trustee could frustrate these intentions. Moving on to Jeremy Balfour's amendments, I understand that amendment number 46 is in response to the concerns raised about having to assess the capacity of a fellow trustee. I disagree that this places an unfair burden on trustees. Stakeholders have noted that it is helpful for the administration of smaller trusts to have a mechanism to remove trustees in clear-cut cases which does not involve going to court. First of all, trusteeship is by the very nature burdensome. It comes with duties as well as powers and this should be recognised by individuals when they agree to take on this role. Secondly, I would point out to the committee that while trustees have the power to remove an incapable trustee, they do not, they do not need to exercise it. In le less certain cases, trustees will have the option to go to court to remove and so do not have to take the legal decisions themselves. The Scottish Law Commission also recognised this in its report. In cases where there is any doubt, the appropriate route is to seek removal by the court. 
In other words, the power in section seven is just one tool in the trustees toolbox. Finally, as I set out in my letter to the committee last week, that I intend to use the explanatory notes to make clear that a trustee who considered themselves to have been unfairly removed by the co-trustees on any of the grounds mentioned in section seven can raise legal proceedings to challenge that decision. This goes to the ultimate safeguard, which is, which is that any trustee who thinks that they have been removed unfairly can challenge their removal in court. This is about finding the right balance between ensuring that trusts can be managed effectively and avoiding the need to go to court and spend trust funds in order to do so, for instance, in every case where the trustees by majority wish to remove an incapacitated co-trustee. I believe there is a balance in section seven is right and there is enough safeguards in place to prevent abuse of this. Jeremy Balfour's amendment will tilt this balance too far in the opposite direction and the very real problem of incapable trustees continuing to hold office because trusts cannot afford the court application to remove them will continue and all the problems and issues that causes that are caused for the administration and trusts. I thank the member for his amendment 59 which seeks to amend section 55 of the bill. My view, however, is that the amendment is unnecessary. It's clear to me that the section has already drafted, achieves exactly what the amendment is trying to, seeking to clarify. Section 55.4 states that approval on behalf of a person who is incapable may give any person authorised to give it. This is clear. If a guardian does not have the powers relating to the matter, they cannot authorise any approval on behalf of the incapable adult for the purposes of this section. I'm concerned that by agreeing to the amendment, Parliament invertedly gives an impression that it meant something else and creates the uncertainty as to what it meant. I am, however, willing to use the explanatory notes to set out the view in more detail, and I would urge the members to not move Amendment 59, or if he does, I would ask the committee to reject it. Amendments 49, 50 and 51 in Jeremy Balfour's name would introduce a presumption that a trustee is capable and that it would be, it would be for the court to, deter, to determine otherwise. In addition, they would confer on Scottish ministers a power to divide, define incapable by regulations subject to the affirmative procedure. The presumption would not only apply in certain circumstances, including where a trustee appoints a new trustee under section two of the bill and under section 12, where an incapable trustee cannot make a decision. These provisions were considered carefully by the SLC and as drafted, these amendments will make the administration of trust much more difficult than I think that it needs to be. To give an example, under section 12 of the bill, a decision is binding on the trustees as a whole if made by the majority of those who are able to make it. It then goes on to provide incapable trustees are not eligible to take part or may not be counted when calculating the majority. Amendment 50 would have, to, would have the practical effect of ensuring that incapable trustees do, do count towards calculating the majority, which is a recipe for administrative deadlock. To resolve this issue, trusts would have to apply to the court and the beneficiaries would ultimately bear the legal costs. Under the bill as introduced, any trustee who considered themselves to have been unfairly replaced or excluded from decision making by the co-trustees can raise legal proceedings to challenge that decision. There are therefore already sufficient safeguards in place. I move amendment four in my name and urge members to support my other amendments in the group. I would ask the committee to reject Jeremy Balfour's amendments which were not rec recommended by the committee at stage one. Thank you, Convener. Yep. Thank you, Minister. And move to Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 46 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. And if I can um, move, first of all, um, Amendment number uh, 59 in my uh, name. Um, as the Minister says, this simply is a clarification of, I think, the law at the moment. The effect of this would be well, it clarifies that any person authorised under the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000 or the law of any country other than Scotland must have relevant powers which allow them to give approval on behalf of an incapable adult. 
reason for bringing this forward is again appointments under the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000 extend only so far as the specific powers conferred on that person appointed under the Act. And I think this will again bring clarity. I, I accept the Minister um, thinks that this is already in place, but I think this will help us and help those going forward um, as interpretation of this Act takes place. In regard to um, the whole area of um, capacity and the, the appropriate person, um, I think it would be fair to say that this was the area that the committee took a lot of evidence on and there was um, a lot of discussion around this area. In regard to my amendment number 51, um, I have thought hard and long about this. The Minister has written to the committee to say that the majority of stakeholders uh, were happy with the definition within the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000, and, and that was the case. However, we did take evidence from other stakeholders, um, from academics and from others, who thought that definition, uh, one, will change or might change, but even the definition itself doesn't give absolute clarity for trust law. What I am proposing this morning, convener, is that the Scottish Government take time to reflect on this further and that any definition is brought forward by regulations which would come to this committee in due course. This would uh, allow, I think, stakeholders and Scottish Government to do further work on it and depending when this bill, if it becomes an act, comes into force, would also give time to see where we are in regard to any definition within Adults Within Capacity Scotland Act. The power would also allow, as the Minister's Amendment does, that for future um, clarity, that any other new definition could be brought forward by regulations as well. So it gives that flexibility, which is both in my amendment and within the government. I suppose the decision for the committee this morning is are they comfortable with that definition within the 2000 Act or do they think we need some more time to take more evidence and for government, Scottish Government to scrutinise that more? And my view would be that that would be helpful. In regard to amendment number 50 with my name, again, this is an area where we have taken evidence on and the Minister is right, there, there is a balancing act here between um, what the role of the trustees who want to remove a trustee have compared to those that don't. Uh, my view is that it shouldn't be for the individual who had been removed to have to go to court, but it should be for the trustees who are removing that person if there's not an agreement to go to court. Um, actually, the Scottish Government Minister made the argument almost for me in her statement in regard to cost. Her, her comment was that it could cost the Trust money if it had to defend such an action, or sorry, so if it had to bring forward such an action. Uh, the argument is true for somebody that wants to remain a trustee. It, the, there is the provision for expenses at the end of the proceedings but someone that came forward would have to find that initial money, both legal fees and court fees, to bring that forward. I think the balance is wrong in regard to that. I think that should be a role of the, the trustees who want to remove that individual. So I would seek that we put that burden on the trustees rather than on the person that's been removed. Now, I think it would be fair to say, and hopefully fair to say, that this power whichever way we go, is exceptional, that in most case, cases people do step down um, voluntarily. But where that is the exceptional case, for me, the cost should lie with the trust, not with that trustee. And so in regard to the other amendments, um, we will, I will be supporting the government on them. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Balfour. So any other amendments? Sorry, any other colleagues, any comments? Okay. Uh, Minister, would you like to wind up? 
Thank you, convener. Um, as I did say, these amendments, uh, if they were to be brought forward, would, would mean more costs to trust and to, to remove an administration of trustees, and it might be more difficult. I am comfortable with the definition of the 2000 Act. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, with that, the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. After we move on to after section six, the executors of persons unlawfully killed. I call amendment number five in the name of the minister, grouped with amendments thirty-eight and thirty-nine. And ask the minister to move amendment number five and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Uh, I move amendment number five. I believe I speak for all of us when I say that it is unacceptable for a convicted murderer uh, can continue to act as an executor in their victim's estate. The present position in Scott law, Scott law, Scott's law appears to be uncertain, with some suggesting that the law has one, one effect while others disagree. The leading practitioner's textbook on the administration of estates suggests that the appointment of a murderer is valid but should ordinarily be declined. But there is one well-known case which shows that a convicted killer cannot be relied on to decline office. I'd like to th take this opportunity to thank all the campaigners for all this work on this issue. Amendments 5, 38 and 39 in my name will clarify the law. An executor convicted of or being prosecuted for the murder or culpable homicide of the deceased will be regarded as unfit for that office and can therefore be removed by the court. An application to remove can be made at the appropriate sheriff court and the provision will be retrospective. So for example, an executor convicted of murder before the provision comes into force could be removed from office. In addition, where a sheriff is considering an application for the appointment of an executor dative and is satisfied that the person seeking appointment has been convicted of or is being prosecuted for the murder or culpable homicide of the deceased, the sheriff must refuse the application. This is a practical solution that will both provide a resolution and help to ease the distress of other persons who may find themselves in this situation. Importantly, it also provides the necessary legal certainty that means the administration of the deceased estate cannot be called into question because of questions about the validity, validity of the executor's appointment. Convener, can I move amendment number five? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Minister. Uh, colleagues? Any comments? No? Okay. Uh, I think, Minister, just taking a one uh, comment. It's uh, certainly been me working through the, uh, the earlier stages of the, of the bill process. Uh, I, think, I think we were all uh, in the same page that we wanted to get to a, a, a good outcome here because uh, it's very much a, a challenging area. And so I think the, the, the amendment uh, in front of us certainly is, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll certainly do that. So, with that, um, uh, ask the Minister to wind up. Couldn't just move, thanks. Okay, thank you. So, the question is, Amendment number five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move on to section seven. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment number four. Ask Jeremy Balfour to move or not move. Uh, move, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. The question is, Amendment number 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, no. No. Okay, so. Yes. No, I, I said no. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So there'll be a division. Uh, so all those who agree, please raise your hands. All those uh, against. And there are no abstentions. So the vote is um, yeah, two. I'm sorry. Yes, it's two for and three against and no abstentions. So with that, the, so amendment at number 46 is not agreed to. I call amendment number six in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment number 52. I ask the minister to move formally. Move, convener. Thank you. And the question is that amendment number six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
Okay, thank you. And the question is that section seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that sections eight and nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to section number ten, call amendment number seven in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment number four. Ask the minister to move formally. Move convener. Okay. The question is that amendment number seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section ten be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section eleven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Move to section 12, it's the decision making, powers of trustees and the validity of certain transactions and documents. I call amendment number 8 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I ask the Minister to move amendment number 8 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Section 12 generally is a default section which applies to a trust unless the trustee provides otherwise. The SLC's policy intention on this issue is quite clear as are the explanatory notes. The effect of section 12.1, as drafted at the moment, however, does not appear as intended to accommodate arrangements under a trust which will provide for trustees to take decisions other than a majority. I am aware that some stakeholders have questioned the status of existing trusts which require a specific trustee to be involved in making a decision. The clear policy intention is that such trusts should continue to operate as they currently do. Amendment number eight resolves this issue by making clear that section 12.1 is a default rule, which can be departed from by express provision in the trust deed or where implied or required by the context where there is no trust deed. In its stage one report, the committee asked me to look at defining a number of terms that were raised by stakeholders. I wrote to the committee setting out that I would consider this further. On one of these terms was the definition of beneficiary in the context of public trust, which was raised by the Law Society, who said that the definition used in the bill is geared towards private trusts and is not particularly suited to public trusts. Since stage one, I have looked at this matter further with this, and the Scottish Government has spoken to the Law Society. I think that in the context of trustee decision making in a public trust, this matter could be helpfully clarified. Section 12 provides a default rule that a, dis a decision binds the trustees only if it is made by a majority of those for the time being, for time being able to make it. Importantly, a trustee is not to be regarded as able to make a decision where they or might have had a personal interest in the decision but this can be overridden by the trust deed or in specific circumstances. One such circumstances is where all beneficiaries know of the personal interests and consent to the trustee acting. While this circumstance may work in the context of a private trust, it would be unlikely to work in the context of a public trust. So amendment number nine sets out that section 12 2A of the bill may be disregarded where the trust is a public trust and the decision is intended to benefit a section of the public which is a trustee is a member. In these circumstances, the trustee in question should not be disqualified from participating in the decision making process by reason of their, their being a member of the section of the public which the decision is intended to benefit. However, a trustee is not permitted to participate in decisions in which the trustee has the particular interest specific to them as an individual. In other words, where the trustee's personal interest in the decision is greater than or goes beyond their general interest in the decision as a member of the section of the public which the decision is intended to benefit. They should not be allowed to participate in the decision-making process. Amendment 12 is about section 22 of the bill, which relates to section 2 of the Apportionment Act 1870, which provides that all rent, annuities, dividends and other periodical payments in the nature of interest should be considered as accruing from day to day and may be express, expressly disapplied by the trust deed. I am concerned about the potential unintended intended tax consequences of the power conferred upon, upon trustees by this section. 
in order to avoid the risk of the imposition of higher taxes, Amendment 12 adjusts the provision on the trust law to set out the default provision that trustees have the discretion to decide whether either to time a portion of income in accordance with Section 2 of the 1870 Act or treat income as accruing when it arises. Amendment 22 in my name sets out that as a simple majority of the trustees, trustees must sign a document for it to be validly um, executed. There is tension between sections 40 and 73 of the bill. Section 40 provides that a deed is valid if executed by a majority of such the body of trustees as are both capable and traceable. On the other hand, section 73 inserts a provision into the 1995 Act that takes no account of whether the trustees are incapable or untraceable. Incapable and untraceable trustees should be included in the to total number of trustees for the purposes of calculating the numbers required to form a majority to validly execute trustees for a number of reasons. Whether a trustee is incapable or untraceable will change over time. If the number of trustees required to execute a trustee is tied to these matters, the number of trustees required to validly execute a trustee will also change over time. It would not be possible to look simply at the number of trustees in office at the time of execution of the deed and at the, at the number of signatories on the deed to ascertain whether the document is validly executed. Instead, there would be a requirement to look behind the document to establish whether any of the trustees who were in office at the time that the deed was executed were incapable or untraceable at that time. This is impractical and would create uncertainty for any person seeking to rely on deeds executed by trustees. If incapable and untraceable trustees in office make it difficult for the active trustees to command a majority to execute deeds, the bill already provides sufficient mechanisms for their removal from office. This includes section six and seven of the bill, which allows the courts or trustees in some cases to remove a co-trustee. Convener, I'd like to move on to Jeremy Balfour's amendment number 54. The effect of section 30 of the bill is to render ineffective a provision in a trustee which purports in a blanket fashion to limit a trustee's liability for breach of fiduciary duty or to indemnify a trustee of such breach. There is, however, an exception for a provision which authorises a, a particular transaction or a particular class of transaction which would otherwise be in breach of fiduciary duty. The policy intention behind this section is to protect beneficiaries from overly broad clauses that seek to limit a trustee's liability or indemnity clauses. It is there to protect trust property and by extension beneficiaries from acts of trustees that breach their fiduciary duties. The SLC were well aware that broad provisions, provisions risk abuse especially as it might be seen to encourage trustees to misuse the office of their, to their personal advantage. Amendment 54 would have the opposite effect from what was attended from the SLC. It would widen the range of circumstances that can be covered by provisions to limit liability and indemnify trustees for breaches of duty. This would all be a poten to potential detriment of beneficiaries who would find that their usual rights of recourse against trustees who have breached their trustees' duties are either weakened or unavailable. On amendment number 55, I under understand the point made by Jeremy Balfour and I am happy to support it. Finally, on amendment number 56, I can see that this would be a useful addition to section number 39 of the bill and I'm happy to support it, although I may need to think about how it interacts with other provisions in the bill with a view to bringing forward stage three amendments to make the necessary adjustments. I move amendment eight and urge members to support the other amendments in my name in this group. I would ask members to support Jeremy Balfour's amendment. Um, amendments 55 and 56 but if Mr Balfour wishes to press amendment number 54 which was not recommended by the committee in the stage one report I would ask the committee to reject it. Thank you Member Sound. I'm going to ask uh, Jeremy Balfour to speak to amendment 54 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you Karina. Um, in regard to amendment 54 um, I, I think interesting again during the evidence session uh, there was sometimes um, 
a conflict between those who came from perhaps an academic background in regard to trust law and those who actually practice it day in, day out. And Amendment 54 um, has been uh, has been drafted and been helped me to draft it um, by the Law Society of Scotland and I think reflects actually what practitioners are looking for in regard to day-to-day -day working. The amendment would extend the effect of protective clauses in the trustees to all actions and decisions of the trustees and I think give them that protection. A trustee may contain a provision purporting to limit liability for or indemnity for breach of a fiduciary duty. This is most likely to be relevant where a trustee is also a beneficiary, where a trustee's fiduciary duty would be likely to be put their personal interest in a conflict of interest with their duty as a trustee. This is often expressly permitted, sometimes with qualifications within a trustee. And it seems that such, such protection will continue to be effective because of section 30, subsection 2. But such protection is usually seen to be wider than transactions, and it may be more appropriate, I would argue, to allow protective clauses to extend to all actions or decisions of the trustees. I think this will give greater scope for trustees, and as we know, it, it becomes even more and more difficult sometimes to find trustees to do the job, and I think to give them its protection will hopefully encourage more to come forward. Um, I'm grateful to the Minister in regard to her support of Amendment 55. This amendment would allow the Court to determine that the trust property should bear none of the damages where this is appropriate. And in regard to Amendment 56, again, I'm grateful for the Minister in regard to her um, accepting this, and I'm certainly happy to work with her if there needs to be some tidying up at Stage 3. The effect amendment is simply, again, a clarification for the provisions on validity of certain transactions entered into by a trustee, extends to transactions in exercise of powers and trustees, as well as those powers implied by sections 13 subsection 1 and 16 subsection 1 of the bill. In regard to the um, other amendments within this grouping uh, brought forward by the Minister, um, I, I am happy to be supporting them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And any colleagues have any questions or points? Okay, thank you. I ask the Minister to wind up. Thank you, Convener. Just in relation to Amendment 54, I understand the Law Society's intention, but the way it is drafted is far too widely and it defeats the Bill's intention altogether. I would ask that committee members reject it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the question is Amendment number 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 8. I ask the Minister to move formally. Move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment number 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment number 4. I ask the Minister to move formally. Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The questions at sections 13 to 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. Move to after section 17, that's investments and sale of property. I call amendment number 11 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendment 47. I ask the Minister to move amendment 11 and speak to both amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, in its Stage 1 report, the Committee recognises that the power may already exist for trustees to choose to invest in a way which allows them to consider objectives beyond maximising financial returns, subject to the terms of the trust deed. Nevertheless, it is recommended that the Bill is amended to put this matter beyond doubt, and Amendment 11 does this. I am grateful to the Committee for all their work on this matter. This amendment is intended to be a reinstatement of the current legal position, taking account of case law, to make, but to make the position clearer for users of the legislation for a trust deeds in the future. It will make clear that unless the trust deed provides otherwise non-financial considerations in the form of ethical, social and environmental considerations, sometimes known as ESG or environmental, social or governance factors, can be taken into account by trustees when choosing between alternative investments, 
that may perform equally well and is subject to overall trust purposes. It might be helpful to the committee if I can give an example to illustrate how this provision might work in practice. If a trust is established with the purpose, purposes that makes no reference to and has no connection with environmental goals, then this section will allow trustees to properly take environmental considerations into account when choosing investments for the trust. If the trustees obtain advice from an appropriate financial advisor that the environmentally friendly investment has the best financial prospects or has equally as good financial prospects as any other investment, then trustees may properly decide that environmentally friendly investment is a suitable investment. This section will give trustees the confidence to take into account about non-financial considerations when making decisions about investing trust property in line with the trust purposes. Amendment 11 in my name already sets out that trustees can take into account non-financial considerations when considering investment decisions. My amendment will be of some assistance to trustees of a charitable trust in the situation described by the member. However, I do have serious concerns about the effect of the member's amendment number 47. Firstly, it singles out heritable property and thereby calls into doubt whether such trustees must achieve best value for movable property. Secondly, no substantial work or consultation with the Scottish charity regulator, OSCAR, has been undertaken, nor with the charity sector about whether such a power is needed or even wanted. By singling out charities that takes the form of trust, you're creating a two-track system for Scottish charities as those that will take the form of a trust account for only 12% of them are Scottish char charities. At the minimum, this would cause unnecessary complexity in the law. In addition, it could have unintended and unforeseen consequences to existing charities of all legal forms and those which may be set up in the future. Oscar has expressed to the Scottish Government that this amendment raises a number of issues which require further detailed consideration, including its impact on the charity trustees' duties, the fact that a trustee's intentions could be disregarded, and the different treatment of charities depending on their legal form. Oscar has suggested that this matter could form part of a wider review of charity regulation that the Scottish Government will undertake. Ultimately, Amendment Number 47 is about charity law and not trust law, and it would be inappropriate to make such a sweeping change to charity law in this bill. When you put the question to John MacArthur at Stage 1, he said, I think we're all in danger of mixing up charity law with trust law, and I'd be slightly concerned if we were to go down a route that you are suggesting where there could be a conflict between charity law and trust law. I'm of similar view... And if this amendment were passed, I would consider that we have significant unintended effects on the charity sector. Therefore, I would ask that the committee to reject Amendment 47, which is not recommended at Stage 1, and I would move and ask members to support my Amendment Number 11. Okay, thank you, Minister. And before I bring in uh, Mr Balfour, just a reminder, Minister, to uh, any comments to go through the Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 47 and other amendments in the group. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, I welcome um, Amendment number 11 in the Minister's name and will be supporting that. And I think the committee did highlight that in our report. Um, amendment 47 brought forward by me is after consult consultation with an, uh, a number of third sector charities and also comes from my own personal experience, both as a, a trustee uh, previously and also having worked in the third sector. I um, am of the view that this doesn't change the law in Scotland in any way at all, but like Amendment Number 11 in the Scottish Government name, simply clarifies the law so that trustees who are working within the charitable sector are clear about it. The, well, what my amendment suggests is that where um, a charity is selling heritable property, it does not need to always get best value for that property if that has been passed on to another charity. 
the practical effect of that will allow charities to help support other charities without necessarily getting the maximum income required. It doesn't force trustees to do that. It simply clarifies that they can look at that if they want to do. I don't believe that um, changes the law as is at the moment. And there are opinions from senior counsel which I outline the situation as it is within my amendment. So all I am seeking to do on this is simply to clarify the law as Amendment 11 seeks to clarify the law so that um, charities who have trust can go forward in regard to their work. Um, the reason for simply having heritable property is that that will often be the largest asset and the most valuable asset, and I think that brings clarification from that. So I, I do think Amendment 47 is not new law. I think it is clarification of the law, and thus I would be asking the committee to support that today. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, do any other colleagues have this? Rhoda Grant. Just, just a question of clarification. Are trustees um, under obligation at the moment to um, sell to the to to the highest bidder, and as far as this goes, or can they take a lower um, offer? Depend. So Jeremy's saying this clarifies the law. I'm wondering if the law, as it stands, um, does this anyway. This, where, the, where there's a bit of confusion is this is charity law and at the moment there's only 12% of trusts are, are charities so this is where there's serious concerns from a Scottish charity regulator Oscar and that's why we will not be supporting it That doesn't really answer my question I'm sorry, sorry I... That doesn't really answer my question I'm, I'm wondering what the obligation um, on charitable trusts is at the moment does this change it or does it remain the same? We do feel at the moment it does change the law. This amendment would change the law okay. between trust and charity. Okay, thank you. Any other members? No? Okay, thank you. Ministers, to wind up, please. Thank you, um, Convener. Just as, as I've just previously stated, due to the serious concerns from the, the Scottish Charity um, Regulator, Oscar, I ask the committee not to, to reject um, amend num amendment number 47. Okay, thank you. So the question is, amendment number 11, be agreed to? Uh, are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 47 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with amendment number 11. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not to move? Uh, move, Commissioner. Okay. So the question is, that amendment 47 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. No. Okay, so there will be a division. So all those who agree with Amendment 47, uh, please raise your hands. All those who disagree. And there are no amendments. So it's uh, the vote is 3 for yes, uh, 2 against, and there are no abstentions. So Amendment 47 is agreed to. The questions at sections 18 to 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Move to section 22. I call amendment 12 in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment number 8. I ask the minister to move formally. Move, convener. Thank you. The question is amendment number 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes. The question is that sections 23 and 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We move to section 25. I call amendments 13, 14 and 15 in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move the amendments 13 to 15 on block. Move all amendments, convener. Thank you. I ask uh, whether any member objects to a single question being put to amendments 13 to 15. No. Okay. So uh, the question is that amendments 13 to 15 are agreed to. Are well agreed? The question is that section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to section 26. I call amendment 16 uh, in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amendment number 4. I ask the Minister to move formally. Move, convener. The question is that amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 17 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amendment number 4. I ask the Minister to move formally. 
moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment number 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We move to duty of sorry, duty to provide information. I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment number 21. Uh, ask the Minister to move Amendment 18 and speak to both amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 18 and 21 are my response to the Committee's request for the Government reviews the Stage 1 evidence on the Trustee's duty to provide information with a particular focus on potential beneficiaries. Stakeholders questioned whether the duties imposed on Trustees should cover potential beneficiaries who might never stand to benefit from Trust property and are thereby too onerous. When it comes to information rights, there is a balance to be had between the rights of those who may benefit from the trust property as a whole and the rights of individual potential beneficiaries. I recognise that requiring trustees to inform potential beneficiaries about their position under a trust could lead to costs being incurred on the trust property, but against that, those who benefit or may benefit from the trust property have a fundamental role in holding the trustees accountable. And they cannot do that if they're not properly informed. Officials have explored this matter further with the stakeholders and with the Scottish Law Commission. Amendments 18 and 21 deal with the problem of vexatious requests for information about trusts made by people who are technically potential beneficiaries but who have no real chance of becoming a beneficiary under the trust. The shift in balance of trustees' information duties will ultimately help beneficiaries and potential beneficiaries who are likely to benefit from the trust property. Firstly, it does not affect their right to trust information, and secondly, it reduces the likelihood of costs being incurred against a trust property which relate to vexatious requests for information. Convener, I move amendment number 18. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, any colleagues have any questions for the Minister? Any comments? Okay, uh, so Minister to wind up. I'm happy to. Moving. Okay. Thank you. So the question is, amendment number 18 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendments 19, 20 and 21, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 19 to 21 on block. Move amendments on block. Ask whether any member objects to a single question be put on amendments 19 to 21. So the question is that amendments 19 to 21 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 27 to 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to section 30. And I call amendment 54 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with amendment number 8. Ask Jeremy Balfour to move or not move. Uh, move, convener. Thank you. And the question is, Amendment 54 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Yes. no. Okay. So there will be a division. So all those who agree, please raise your hands. Uh, all those against? And there are no abstentions. So uh, the result of the division is two for and three against. And there are no amendments. So the amendment <coughs> number 54 is agreed to. Sorry, it's not no, agreed to. It's not agreed to. Sorry. <clears throat> so the question is that section 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 31 to 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to section 35. I call amendment 55 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with amendment number 8. I ask Jeremy Balfour to move or not move. Uh, move, Convener. Yeah. The question is that amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 36 to 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to section 39. I call amendment 56 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with amendment number 8. I ask Jeremy Balfour to move or not move. Uh, move, convener. Thank you. And the question is that amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that section 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Move to section 40. I call amendment 22 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amendment number 8. I ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally, Kavina. The question is that amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
And the question is that section 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to section 41. That's the duration of private trust. I call amendment 57 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with amendment number 58. I ask Jeremy Balfour to move amendment 57 and speak to both amendments in the group. Mr. Uh, thank you, convener. Amendment 57 um, deals with section 41 um, of the bill. The amendment would bring existing trusts within the scope of section 41, where the truster has expressly provided for anticipated changes in the law in the trust deed. Uh, the reason for bringing forward this amendment this morning is that changes to the law on accumulation periods have been in anticipation for some time. Granters of existing trusts may have expressly provided for such changes in the trust deed and should be able to benefit from these new uh, provisions. In regard to Amendment 58, this um, effect of this amendment, if passed this morning, it would bring charitable trusts within the scope of Section 41, but would retain restrictions on accumulation of income for public trusts, which are not charitable trusts. The bill, as introduced at the moment, excludes public trusts which are charitable trusts from the abolition of restrictions on accumulation of income, with the result that such charitable trusts will remain subject to existing accumulation of income rules. In uh, my view, this is not appropriate, and the scope of the section should be extended to include charitable trusts. Trustees of charitable trusts are subject to other rights and duties under charity law and tax law to manage funds appropriately and subject to the oversight of OSCA and HMRC. These rights and duties apply to all charities, whether they are legal form, and empower OSCA and HMRC to control inappropriate accumulation of income by charities without reference to the express restrictions on accumulation of trust law, which apply only to charities constituted as trusts. There may be reasons consistent with a charitable's purpose for income to be accumulated, for example, to generate funds for the next cycle of charity work, or for a specific project and retain retention for probation on accumulation of income for charitable trusts may inhibit appropriate accumulations and would have see or little practical purpose when inappropriate accumulation is sufficiently controlled by charity law and tax law. Removal of the existing trust law restrictions on accumulation would bring the trust into line with other legal forms available for the constitutional charities, whereas retention of the restrictions may make the trust less attractive as a vehicle for constituting charitable work in circumstances in which a trust would otherwise be the most appropriate form. Non-charitable public trusts are not subject to the same charity and tax law controls as charitable trusts, and there is a case for retaining the existing trust law restrictions on accumulation of public trusts which are not charities. This would guard against excessive long-term accumulation in non-charitable public trusts set up to pursue schemes which may take decades to materialise. I think this will bring clarity again and so I do move Amendment 58. OK, thank you. And any colleagues have any points or questions on this? OK, thank you. Uh, Minister? Thank you, Convener. Section 41 of the bill is about how long trusts can accumulate income. The current law in this area is complex, uncertain and inconsistent, and the SLC's recommendation to repeal the existing rules met with universal support. A number of stakeholders, however, have questioned why charitable trusts are treated differently from other types of trusts, meaning that they cannot accumulate income. Amendment 58 in Jeremy Balfour's name would allow them to do so. I have serious concerns about the effect of this amendment. Trusters who set up public or charitable trusts are almost invariably want the benefits to be provided immediately. So I do not think this exclusion will create any practical difficulties. More importantly, at stage one evidence, I laid out my concerns that accumulations over a long period of time in charitable trusts 
could fall foul of the charity test set out in sections 7 and 8 of the Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act 2005. And I also told you of my concerns that it may have the definition of charitable purposes, which is applicable for UK tax purposes as provided by the Charities Act 2006. Since then, the Scottish Government has corresponded with OSCA and they have said that if there, if there was no statutory limit to accumulation for charities, it would have serious concerns about whether a trust would have a directed long-term accumulation was meeting the charity test and therefore the ch trust charitable status could be caused into question. The committee did not recommend this at stage one report. On amendment number 57, I understand that some trustees may have anticipated the change brought about by section 41 of the bill and might have draft, drafted their trust deed with that in mind. And this is especially so given that the time between the SLC making their recommendations and when this bill was introduced. Amendment 57 would allow trust property to be disposed of in line with the tr trustees' wishes. Uh, where the change was anticipated over this time. However, as drafted, Amendment 57 may not quite achieve the intended aim, so I may have to revisit this again at Stage 3. It was on this basis that Amendment 58 could have unintended consequences for the Scottish charity sector and the work of OSCAR, and I urge Committee to reject it, and I ask them to support Amendment number 57. Okay, thank you. And I ask Jeremy Balfour to wind up the press or withdraw amendment number 57. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm grateful for the Minister's support in regard to amendment 57 and clearly, if it needs tidying up, happy to work with her and her officials in regard to that. Um, I think in regard to amendment 58, again, the Minister has almost answered the issue of IMIS, that if uh, a child for the trust does go for too long a period, in accumulating income, or then the intervention would come from OSCAR in regard to that. But at the moment, as drafted, the charity couldn't, for example, think in three years' time we want to do something, and we can't accumulate that money for a three-year period. Now, if it went on for an excessive period of time and OSCAR had concerns, they can intervene in regard to that and talk to the trustees about it, as can HMRC. So I think the um, concern that the Minister seems to express that this could go on for years and years is actually dealt with by the power that Oscar have. And my concern is, is that as it is drafted at the moment, Childhood Trusts trust couldn't look to any short-term or medium-term financial accumulation of income so that it can be spent. And so I do think Amendment 58, as it is drafted, Gives, the, gives Oscar intervention powers, which they have already, and that the trust has to be accountable to Oscar and to HMRC. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, so, amendment 57 in my name. Okay, okay, thank you. So the question is, Amendment 57 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 58 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment number 57. I ask Jeremy Balfour to move or not move. Uh, move, Convener. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment number 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Uh, no. So there'll be a division. And so all those in favour of Amendment 58, please raise your hands. All those against? Okay. And there are no abstentions. So the result of the division is 3 4 and 2 against. So with that, amendment number 58 is agreed to. The question is that section 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Move to section 42, the private purpose trusts. I call amendment 23 in the name of the minister and a group on its own. I ask the minister to move and speak to amendment number 23. Minister. Thank you, convener. During stage one, the committee heard evidence on how private purpose trusts are defined in section 42 of the bill and whether that definition is sufficient to distinguish between private purpose trusts with a beneficiary and regular trusts. The definition of the term private purpose trust is important for the operation of the bill as a whole and for the SLC's policy intentions. For example, there are several provisions in the bill which expressly do not apply to 
private purpose trusts. The Scottish Government has explored this matter further with the SLC and Amendment 23 alters the definition of private private purpose trusts in the bill. It clarifies that such a trust exists where the trust property is held by or is vested in a trustee for the furtherance of a specific purpose which is not a charitable or other public purpose. And in <coughs> contrast to a regular trust, it is not constituted solely for the benefit of a specific beneficiary or a potential beneficiary. This reinforces the distinction between a beneficiary trust which have as their sole purpose as the benefit of a specific beneficiary or potential beneficiary and private purpose trust whose purposes are not solely to benefit a specific beneficiary or a potential beneficiary. And convener, I move amendment 23. Okay, thank you very much. Any colleagues have any points or questions for the minister? No, okay, thank you. The minister would like to wind up. I'm happy to move. Thank you, Karina. Okay. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 43 to 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to Section 49. That's protectors. I call Amendment 24 in the name of the Minister on, in a group of its own. The Minister to move and speak to Amendment number 24. Minister. Convener, thank you. Uh, protectors have proved successful in other trust jurisdictions and the SLC concluded that they are almost certainly competent under Scots law, albeit that their appointment is not common. Section 49 of the bill clarifies that protectors can be appointed under Scots law and provide a list of example powers that might be conferred on protectors by a trust deed. This list was designed to be wide since the Office of Protector is relatively novel in Scots law, but I have listened to the concerns raised by stakeholders about some of the powers and I recognise the committee's concerns. That is why Amendment Number 24 in my name removes these powers from the illustrative list in Section 49. And this does not, however, limit the generality of the powers that can be conferred on the Protector. Convener, I move Amendment Number 24. Okay, thank you. Uh, do members have any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. That's the Minister to wind up. Happy to move, Convener. Thank you. So the question is Amendment 24 be agreed to or well agreed? The question is that Section 49 be agreed to or well agreed? The question is that Sections 50 to 54 be agreed to or well agreed? We move to Section 55 and I call Amendment 59 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment Number Four, and ask uh, uh, Jimmy Balfour to move or not move. Uh, move, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is: that Amendment Fifty Nine be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. No. The question is: that Section Fifty Five be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Move to Section Fifty Six: The role of the court. I call Amendment Sixty in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with Amendments Thirty One, Thirty Two, and Forty Two. I ask Jeremy Balfour to move Amendment 60 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, amendment uh, 60 in my name um, would clarify the reference to paragraph uh, C of section 55, subsection 5, which provides for potential beneficiaries rather than ascertained persons specifically. Um, I just think this makes it slightly clearer in what is in the bill and clarity is always a good thing in my mind. In regard to the other amendments within this grouping, I am happy to support them all. Okay, thank you. And I ask the Minister to speak to Amendment 31 and other amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. During the Stage 1 debate on issues about certain types of trusts used for tax avoidance purposes was raised. In the past, trusts have had a reputation as a vehicle used primarily to avoid tax. But over the last couple of decades, this has changed, for example, with the introduction of the Trust Registration Service. Nevertheless, since the debate, I have thought further about the comments and considered what more could be done to this bill to prevent trusts being used to avoid tax otherwise due. Section 64 of the bill includes a statutory court power excisable by the court of session to grant a remedy, if considered appropriate, where a trustee makes a decision which would not have been taken, but for the trustee being in error as to fact or law. In such circumstances, 
the granting of a remedy by the court could have the effect of wholly or partially reducing the trustee's de decision. One particular concern which was not raised by any stakeholder during stage one but was discussed with the L SLC is a potential use of this provision to avoid the consequences of failed tax avoidance scheme entered into by trustees. This has a potential to make Scottish trusts a more attractive vehicle by which to avoid tax than trusts governed by other jurisdictions in the UK. Amendment 31 provides the court with some guidance on how to exercise its wide discretion in relation to the granting of a remedy. The amendment signals to the court and potential applicants the wider public policy considerations engaged, engaged in these types of application. If the purpose of applying to the court was to simply avoid the tax consequences of the trustee's decision, then the court has the discretion to refuse any remedy which it would have had the discretion to do anyway. Moving on to amendment number 32, the SLC looked at how a court can assist trustees by providing guidance, directions and advice where they encounter problems, problems relating to the administration of a trust. It recommended that this power should be suitably restated in primary legislation. When the bill was introduced, our view was that because the courts already had the power to make provision by court rules, primary legislation was not necessary. Stakeholders, including the senators of the College of Justice, however, thought that a provision in primary legislation should be retained to avoid doubt over these matters. It was not our intention to cast doubt on this useful method for for trustees to obtain advice on administrative difficulties encountered in the trust. I've listened to the views of the stakeholders and the committee, and that is why amendment number 32 in my name makes clear provision for the court to assist trustees and others with questions about the administration of a trust. My officials have shared this amendment with the Lord President and his office have confirmed that he welcomes that provision is set out in primary legislation. Amendment 42 responds to the committee's recommendation regarding the role of the court in hearing trust applications. Evidence was taken during stage one about the relative legal costs of applications raised in the sheriff court versus those raised in the court of session. While some suggested that there was no significant difference, others took the opposite view. This is not data held by the Scottish Government as such the Law Society said in its stage one briefing to MSPs. Such information is difficult to capture accurately with reference to trust cases. I've sought information from the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, the Law Society of Scotland, STEP and the Faculty of Advocates about the legal cost to try and get a more accurate picture. This, however, has not proved helpful as a nun could provide the information requested for a variety of reasons. I understand that the committee has run into its own obstacles when it corresponded with the SCTS and the auditor of the court. The auditor, for example, said that trust cases received for account are relatively infrequent and those that are received vary in their individual circumstances and complexity so it'd be difficult to find any particular particularly meaningful insight from any average figure nevertheless i understand the committee's point about seeing flexibility added to the bill so that future provision could be made for a greater choice between the courts when it comes to making different types of trust applications amendment 42 would do that i would confer on the scottish ministers a power with the consent of the lord president of the court session to vary the definition of court in section 74 of the bill this would allow changes to be made to which courts can hear different types of trust applications for example, the bill as introduced allows the court of session on the application of trustees to grant them additional powers of administration or management in relation to trust property. In the future, regulations could be made so that the Sheriff Court may grant those additional powers. After consultation with the Lord President, I have made provision for the consent of the Lord President given their role as head of the judiciary. Given that the power would be available across a range of statutory provisions in this case, I believe that providing for the consent of the Lord President is sensible. 
Finally, the regulations are subject to the affirmative procedure. Lastly, convener, on Jeremy Balfour's amendment number 60, I can understand the point made and I'm happy to support his amendment. I would urge members to support amendments 60, 31, 32 and 42. Thank you, Minister. And members, any comments? Questions? Very briefly, in regard to Amendment 42, can I welcome that um, from the Minister? Um, I think it is um, interesting how difficult it has been both for Scottish Government and for this committee to find the appropriate information. But I think Section 42 does give um, future proofing for the Bill. Clearly, both the Court of Session and the Shadow of Court are always evolving and practice is always evolving. And I think um, I welcome Section 42 so that if things do change in the future, there is that power there both by government and the um, Lord President to grant. So I welcome 42 and I move formally uh, Amendment 60 in my name. Okay. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, a bit ahead there. Sorry, any other colleagues have any questions or points? No, okay. So, Mr. Balfour. Um, formally move 60, convener. Thank you very much. So the question is, Amendment 60 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. The question is, that Section 56 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. The question is, that Sections 57 to 60 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We move to the alteration of trust purposes. And I call Amendment 25 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 28, 29 and 30. I ask the Minister to move Amendment 25 and speak to all the members in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Section 61 of the Bill is about the alteration of trust purposes and attempts to balance the trustor's wishes against the wishes of the beneficiaries by allowing for a period of 25 years of the lifetime of the trustor, whichever is longer before an application can be made to the court. A 25-year Time limit was chosen by the SLC because this section is predominantly intended to deal with long-term trusts and the problems that can arise in relation to them, and 25 years is an easily workable default rule which they consider represents a short generation. The committee heard from stakeholders that the provision is welcome but recommended that applications to court should be made in exceptional circumstances. I have reconsidered this provision after further consultation between my officials and the Law Society of Scotland, STEP and the SLC. And I believe that by allowing the court to decide applications on the evidence is sufficient protection to do away with the default timeline altogether. If amendments 25, 28, 29 and 30 are agreed to, Section 61 would no longer stipulate a default time period during which the purposes of a trust cannot be altered. In effect, it would reverse the position set out when the bill was introduced, setting out a maximum time period of 25 years or a lifetime of a trustor, whichever is longer, during which the trustor may, may trust deed exclude the jurisdiction of the court under Section 61. In my view, these amendments ensure flexibility for trustors who may wish to exclude the jurisdiction of the courts for a short time and protects against the risk that those unhappy with the terms of a trust may mount an early application before any material change of circumstances has occurred. Adding a caveat that would allow relevant persons to raise an application in exceptional circumstances would not be in line with the general policy underpinning this section, which are the problems caused by long-term trusts, and it would be relatively difficult to legislate for what is meant by exceptional circumstances. Finally, any caveat might be abused by persons disappointed by the distribution of the trust property who could raise or threaten to raise court proceedings. Ultimately, the legal expenses of defending such an action would come from the trust property and would be at the, ex at the expense of the uh, existing beneficiaries. Convener, I move amendment number 25 in my name. Okay, thank you, Minister. Do members have any comments or questions? No. Okay, thank you. That's the Minister to wind up, please. Happy to just move, Convener. Okay, thank you. So the question is, Amendment 25 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 26 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment number 4. I ask the Minister to move formally. Formally move, Convener. Yeah. The question is, Amendment 26 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment number 4. I ask the Minister to move formally. Formally move, Convener. 
The question is Amendment 27 be agreed to. I will agree. I call Amendments 28, 29 and 30 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move the Amendments 28 to 30 on block. Moved on block, Convener. I ask uh, whether any member objects to a single question be put on Amendments 28 to 30. Okay. So the question is that Amendments 28 to 30 are agreed to. I will agree. The question is that Section 61 be agreed to. I will agree. The question is that sections 62 and 63 be agreed to. I will agree. Yeah. Move to section 64. I call amendment 31 in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment number 60. I ask the minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. The question is that amendment 31 be agreed to. I will agree. The question is that section 64 be agreed to. I will agree. Yes, call amendment 32 in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment number 60. I ask the Minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. So <clears throat> the question is that amendment 32, sorry, yeah, amendment, yeah. amendment 32 be agreed to. I will agree. Yes. Move to section 65 and the expenses of litigation. I call amendment 33 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments. 34, sorry, yeah, 34, 35, 36, 37 and 40. I ask the Minister to move Amendment 33 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Under the current law, it is usually the case that trustees are personally liable to pay for litigation expenses to successful opponents but have a right of relief against the trust estate. Section 65 sets out the new default position, which is that a trustee does not incur personal liability and will only do so where certain grounds exist and the court exercises its discretion to make an order for expenses against the trustee personally under one of those grounds. Amendments 33, 34, 35, 36 and 37 respond to concerns about the impact of section 65.2 of the bill, which were raised by the Law Society and STEP amongst others. These amendments remove subsection 2 and on the whole the section as amended makes a significant shift away from the likelihood that a trustee would incur personal liability for litigation expenses when compared with what we understand is current practice. Subsection 3 allows the court wide discretion to deal with litigation expenses and allows the courts and allows the courts would take into account all the circumstances when deciding how to exercise its discretion. Amendment number 35 adds to the list of circumstances in which the court may exercise its discretion to find a trustee personally liable for expenses of litigation. The scenario where the trust property is insufficient to meet the expenses incurred in litigating. This ensures that those who may wish to do so cannot abuse trust to raise vexatious litigation and easily avoid the legal costs to do so. Trustees would be able by application under the new subsection A to ask the court to determine liability before expenses were incur incurred. So the trustees would be proceeding with any litigation with their eyes open. Section 65, as already discussed, of the general application to any litigation to which trustees may be party to. Under this section, as introduced, the court can impose personal liability on trustees for litigation expenses in certain circumstances, including where the trust property is insufficient to meet the expenses or the trustee has brought about the litigation by breach of duty. This is, however, limited to the court of session and therefore the provision restricts itself to setting out a statutory regime for how the litigation expenses incurred in the court of session shall be determined. This is not the policy intention and I've listened to the evidence of stakeholders such as the Sheriffs and Summary Sheriffs Association who have pointed out that litigation will also take place in the Sheriff Courts, not just at the court of session. Accordingly, amendment number 40 clarifies the position so the power conferred on the courts by section 65 can be exercised by the court of session and the appropriate sheriff court. I move amendment number 33, convener, and I ask the members to support my other amendments in this group. Thank you, Minister. Do members have any comments or questions? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister would like to wind up. I'm happy to move, Kavina. Okay, thank you. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendments 34, 35, 36 and 37. All in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 34 to 37 on block. Moved on block, Convener. Thank you. I ask uh, whether any member objects to a single question and put on Amendments 34 to 37. The question is that Amendments 34 to 37 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Sections 66 to 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? So we move to after Section 72. It's the time limit for a cohabitant claim on intestacy. Call Amendment 48 in the name of Jeremy Balfour in a group on its own. Jeremy Balfour to move and speak to Amendment 48. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Kavir. The bill we have before us is the Trust and Succession Bill, which hopefully in due course will become an Act. Um, I think it would be fair to say it is um, heavily uh, on trust and very light on succession. And I think there is disappointment uh, within the legal profession that this was an opportunity to reform succession law in a much wider way. Now, as we heard in evidence, both from academics and those within practice, what that uh, change should be might have been more uh, controversial and harder to do. But clearly, I, I think most would agree that succession law, as it is at the moment, is not fit for the 21st century. I am aware that the Scottish Government has said there will be no further legislation within this parliamentary session in regard to succession law, but I would wonder whether perhaps um, the Minister could outline perhaps at stage three in the debate of what plans they do have to extend any consultation around succession law. Um, the Commission, the Scottish Law Commission, have done their work. Um, it is now for the government to put, I think, something out for consultation. And I'm sure the committee and others within Parliament would be interested to know, is there likely to be a further consultation um, within the next two and a half years of this Parliament or not? Uh, turning, you'd be glad to hear now to the specific um, amendment uh, number 48, uh, this um, would insert a new section that would uh, amend the Family Law Scotland Act 2006. It uh, would extend the deadline for a cohabitant to submit a claim from six months to 12. Clearly, every individual case is different in regard to the grieving process, but I think this is simply an extension to allow a cohabitant individual a bit longer to consider their views and con consider what we should do. Clearly, any time limit will affect some, but for me to extend it from six months to 12 months, um, I think just gives people a bit longer to think um, through the emotion of what has happened to them and hopefully will protect some vulnerable individuals if the amendment is accepted by the committee. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Balfour. Do any members have any comments or questions? Okay, uh, Minister. Thank you, convener. When an intestate deceased person was in a cohabiting relationship at the time of death, the survivor can make an application to the court for a fi financial pro uh, provision. They must adhere to strict timelines when doing so six months from the date of death. It has been suggested to the committee that this is unduly short. The committee has heard evidence from a number of stakeholders about the effect of this time limit. I can see suggest, uh, merit in the suggestion that the time limit is extended to 12 months, and I am happy to support it. However, as the Law Society of Scotland pointed out in its stage one briefing, there are other issues encountered by those attempting to apply for financial provision on the death of a cohabitee that may require to be addressed. If the committee agrees to the amendment, I would therefore not propose to commence this provision until we have had opportunity to consider those other issues and, if necessary, address them. As committee will know, the SLC recently reported on financial provision on breakdown of the cohabiting relationship, otherwise 
otherwise than by death. This includes a recommendation on the new definition of cohabitant. The Scottish Government has committed to considering a longer-term programme of implementation of SLC reports over the course of this session. This list includes movable transactions, trust, judicial factors, and it is also included on the SLC's report for cohabitation. On the 6th of September, I wrote to the SLC setting out that detailed work on the report was about to begin. Separately, I'll also set out I'm giving consideration to consulting on the recommendations made in the report, and such a consultation would be an opportunity to seek views on any proposed changes to the law on financial provision for cohabitees on intestacy. If I can just say from Mr Balfour's comments regarding um, the a consultation I will write to the committee ahead of our stage three of this report. I urge members to support amendment number 48. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Balfour to wind up or press or withdraw amendment 48. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Can I thank the Minister for her comment right at the end there and look forward to receiving, um, I'm sure all of us on the committee look forward to receiving that uh, from her. Um, I'm pleased that the government is willing to support um, amendment 48, and I hope that it will come into force in some time in my lifetime. I will not formally move it. Okay, thank you. So the question is that amendment 48 be agreed to, or will agreed? Yeah. The question is that section 73 be agreed to, or are we all agreed? Yes, I call amendment 38 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amendment number 5, and I ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally, convener. Yeah. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <clears throat> Call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment number 5. Ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally, convener. And the question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 40 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment number 33. Ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally, convener. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 49 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment number 4. I ask Jeremy Balfour to move or not move. Uh, move, Convener. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment number 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Okay, so there will be a division. So all those who agree, please raise your hands. Uh, all those against? And there are no abstentions. So the vote is two four and three against. And so amendment number forty nine is not agreed to. I call amendment forty one in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment number four. I ask the minister to move formally. Convener. The question is amendment forty one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section seventy four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? So I call amendment number 42 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment number 60. I ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally, convener. The question is that amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. And uh, call amendment number 50 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment number 4. I ask Jeremy Balfour to move or not move. Uh, not move, convener. Okay. Just so that we have a vote on it. So. Okay. Right. So. Yeah, so if it's not moved, then. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 bill's moving. moving yeah. So, okay. So there, there will be a division. No, it's just moved. It's just moved to the next one. No. No. So there will be a division. No, sorry, yes. Yeah, so, so the question is that Amendment 50 be. Yeah. So the question is that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. No. Okay. So there'll be a division. So all those uh, who agree, please raise your hands. And all those against. And any abstentions? No. Okay. So uh, there are um, nobody was for, there were two against and three abstentions. So the amendment number 50 is not agreed to. 
with the section 75. I call amendment 43 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amendment number 4. I remind members that amendments 43 and 51 are direct alternatives, and that is that they can both be moved and decided on. The text of whichever is the last agreed to is what will appear in the bill. So that's the Minister to move formally. We move, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And I call amendment 51 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with amendment number 4. And once again, I remind members that amendments 43 and 51 are direct alternatives. And that is they can both be moved and decided on. The text of whichever is the last agreed to is what will appear in the bill. So, Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not move, Camino. Not move. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, is that be a no? So, um, so with that, um, so uh, there is a division. So, um, all those who agree with uh, Amendment 51, please raise your hands. All those against? And all those who want to abstain? Okay, so there is nobody for. There are um, two against and three abstentions. So Amendment 51 uh, is not agreed to. So um, go to Amendment number 44. Uh, so call Amendment 44 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment number 52. Ask the Minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 45 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment number 52. Ask the Minister to move formally. Formally move, Convener. Okay. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 77, Schedule 1, Section 78, Section 79, Schedule 2, Section 80, Section 81, and the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And that ends the consideration of amendments at stage two. So now with that, I'd like to thank the Minister and their officials for their attendance today. And that concludes the public part of our meeting today. I'll also allow the Minister uh, and their officials to leave the room and then I'll move the committee into private. So with that, move the committee into private. Thank you very much.